Ms. Yulia Timoshenko, thank you for talking to DW. We have just seen the biggest shakeup in Ukraine's government since the invasion. What do you make of the removal of Oleksiy Reznikov as defense minister? Well, first of all, in today's Ukraine at war, the Minister of Defense is an extremely important figure. And it is very important for Ukraine that this be a figure of the highest level of qualification. The Minister of Defense, according to the Constitution of Ukraine, is in the purview of the President of Ukraine. Only the President has the right, as the country's Commander-in-Chief, to elect the Minister of Defense and submit his candidacy to the Parliament. And in this case, we support the President in dismissing Mr. Reznikov and appointing, submitting another candidate. And in this case, we as a Ukrainian team remain absolutely united and unified, and our team in the parliament supports the appointment of a new Minister of Defense of Ukraine. You lost your 29 bids to the presidency to Volodymyr Zelensky, and I'm keen to know from you what you make of how he has led Ukraine specifically during the war. The war is a major challenge for our country. Before the war, we were in quite a radical opposition to President Zelensky. We did not share his internal reforms, his actions, and in fact, before the war, his support in the society was falling quite rapidly. But the war changed everything. We may or may not share the president's actions in domestic policy, but today we are united, unified, in order to protect Ukraine. That's why, from the first days of the war, we got together with the president of Ukraine, with the entire political team of Ukraine, and we said that there will be no government and no opposition now. There will be a united Ukrainian team that has to win this war together with the entire free world. Even today, we may not support everything that the president's team is doing in Ukraine's domestic policy. We do not support everything that is being done today in the economic and financial sector. But we firmly believe that after the victory, Ukraine will have a chance to build everything right, and this chance will not be lost. We will not lose peace after the victory. But today, victory comes first, and this means the unity of Ukraine in all its spheres, including the political one. One of your deliverables on your 2019 manifesto was that you would take back Crimea. There are voices in some quarters today among Ukraine's allies who have suggested that Ukraine might have to be willing to cede some of its territory to Russia in order to bring the war to an end. What do you make of that? First, I find it extremely negative. I want to say this right away. And Ukraine, which has paid such a heavy price to win this war, to preserve its state, its territorial integrity, will not give up a single centimeter of its territory. And not only because this is our native land, but also because if pieces of our territory are cut off from Ukraine, it will mean that the order established on the basis of the United Nations after World War II no longer works. And then every country that seems weak to someone can be cut into pieces like salami. We cannot allow for this to happen. And that is why Ukraine will fight for the integrity of its territory. This means fighting to preserve the world order that was established after World War II. This is the inviolability of borders. If the free world allows any country to be cut into pieces and ceded to an aggressor who takes this territory by force of arms, it will mean that the world will open a Pandora's box. That is, redistribution of borders will become the new reality of the world. Do we all want this? I think not. You are referring to Russia's President Vladimir Putin as an aggressor now. 
this is somebody who served as your counterpart in Russia in your second stint as uh, prime minister in Ukraine. I wondered if you were as strong a Vladimir opponent, a Vladimir Putin opponent back in your time. If you sit here today and think perhaps you should have been more cautious. No, так ми були не поступові. Well, yes, we were unyielding when it comes to profound national interests of Ukraine or Europe. And this was evident in the gas crisis back in 2009, when Putin actually cut off natural gas to the whole of Europe, which was receiving Russian gas through Ukraine at the height of winter without explaining anything. It was an extremely aggressive and cruel step. And Ukraine was on edge at the time, but it was the first signal that all European leaders and European nations had to pay attention to. And then it was necessary to realize that Putin was using such methods, crossing red lines. And then it was necessary to act and prevent the development of events up to the present day. But even in 2007, at the Munich conference, when Putin gave his keynote speech, it was already clear that aggressiveness, non-perception of reality, and in fact moving against the world order was his foreign policy strategy. And in 2007, I wrote an article about the need to stop Putin. It was 2007. But I was not heard. And today, we all bear the consequences. We need to see aggressive leaders long before they start destroying the world and act preventively, but not put out fires later. And of course, 2008, when I, as Prime Minister, submitted an application for Ukraine's accession to NATO, for a NATO membership action plan, and if they had listened to my proposal and given Ukraine a NATO membership action plan, NATO would have opened its doors to Ukraine back in 2008. There would have been no war today. Ukraine would have been at peace today. Hundreds of thousands of people would have been alive, and there would not have been such consequences of the tragedy that the whole of Europe and the whole world is experiencing from the war that is taking place in Ukraine. It's necessary to act in a timely manner. No, even of course, my government also submitted, practically did all the work related to the signing of the association agreement between Ukraine and the EU, I was paid for all my policies as Prime Minister when Yanukovych came to the presidency, based on a huge election fraud, and then I was thrown in jail for exactly those policies. It wasn't Yanukovych who put me in jail, it was the Kremlin and Yanukovych, because Yanukovych is a puppet of the Kremlin and they don't forgive such things. They have always acted brutally, and today's war is just another cruelty, bloodshed, violence, in order to assert their imperial policy. Uh, you, you've mentioned your time in prison. Uh, you served time for the abuse of power whilst you were in office uh, over gas contracts. Um, you have a bit of a reputation in your home country. You're known as the gas princess, allegedly because of the amount of wealth that you have amassed through dubious gas deals. In a world where credibility is everything, in a world where Ukraine has to signal to its allies that it wants to root out corruption, are you not compromised, respectfully, former Prime Minister? No, uh, first, of all, first of all, it is well known that Kremlin was the author of all these repressions against me. This is obvious. And Manafort, who was also found to have organized this whole campaign together with Yanukovych, but there are decisions of the American court, the Ukrainian court, and the European Court of Human Rights that everything that was done against me had no legal basis. 
There are many decisions, statements of the Congress, the Senate, the European Parliament, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe at the time when I was convicted in my defense. And when I was thrown into prison, many leaders of the parliaments of different countries spoke publicly in my defense, realizing that this was a political persecution. And I can say that this is unfortunately very dangerous to stand against an authoritarian, corrupt system run by the Kremlin. And I have experienced this firsthand very profoundly. And it is absolutely certain that Putin chose the moment to move against Ukraine after Yanukovych took over as president and put Russian citizens in almost all security positions who were destroying our army and bleeding Ukraine's ability to defend itself. And all of this was precisely a prerequisite or rather with the Kremlin's encouragement to turn against Ukraine. I fought against this. I was Yanukovych's opponent. I was his mortal enemy. And so, unfortunately, this whole machine was working against me. But today, Ukraine is completely different. Today, Ukraine has almost gotten rid of this fifth column of the Kremlin. And that is why our unity, Ukrainian unity within the country and our unity with the entire free world today makes it possible for Ukraine to finally throw off the yoke of Russian colonization and become a truly independent country, part of the Western free world. A lot of Ukrainians will find it hard to believe that you're a victim today. I point you back to my initial statement. You are believed to have amassed a lot of money through dubious gas deals. This is absolutely not true. All the circumstances have been fully clarified and there are all the core decisions that prove the opposite. It's just that I found myself in the epicenter of a political struggle. That's why the propaganda that my opponents used against me was backed by millions of dollars in financial resources. That's why the key for me is the court rulings that clearly and explicitly canceled all these completely unfounded things. Uh, it's just that when you go into politics and when you stand up against the system and also against the system that is supported by the Kremlin, you have to be prepared for anything. And today you see that in both Russia and Belarus, opponents of the regime are in prison. And the same was the case in our country, but the country is recovering today. And I believe that political repression and politically motivated persecution will never take place in Ukraine again. And by the way, I just want to remind you that the criminal case that was initiated by Yanukovych was precisely against the gas agreement that was supported by the European Union, supported by Mr. Barroso. It introduced a formula-based approach to price formation and took Ukraine out of dependence on the Kremlin. It was an absolute market-based strong deal for which, in fact, Revenge was taken against me. It was very unfavorable, neither for the Russian Federation nor for the Kremlin's fifth column, which was leading Ukraine at the time. That's why this is a criminal case that is known to everyone and it has no elements of corruption in it and there was no accusation of corruption. It was an accusation, you're right, of abuse of my official power. But the courts proved that there was not even a hint of any crime. It was just a political reprisal. Ukraine should have been holding uh, an election next year in 2024. Uh, I'm keen to know if you think that election should go ahead if the war uh, is continuing. And if you could double up with answering whether or not you would be running for president, you've tried three times, do you still aspire to be the president of Ukraine? First of all, the position of our team, and not only our team, but all people who have 
common sense is that during such a hot war, elections in Ukraine are impossible because it will not be an election. There are a significant number of people who have either been forced to leave Ukraine or are fighting for Ukraine. They will be deprived of the right to either run for office or vote. There can be no political processes in a country that is being attacked by missiles every day. This is unacceptable and impossible. Therefore, we are in favor of a democratic, fair, absolutely free elections, but at least six months after the end of this war. Then it will be real, genuine elections. Today, it is impossible to hold fair, open, competitive elections with the participation of all Ukrainian citizens. Uh, and I can say for sure that our team will definitely take part in the parliamentary and local elections because our team is strong and it has a very well-defined course, a clear course on how to lead Ukraine out of the economic, financial and social ruin in the post-war period. So, yes, definitely. As for the presidential election, I think that time will tell. It will all depend on when the war ends, how it ends, and I'm convinced that it will end in victory. But then the team will decide on the presidential election and our team's participation in it. Ms. Timoshenko, former Prime Minister, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for you. Thank, Thank you. you.